Welcome to another episode of A Therapist, A Buddhist, and You, the podcast that delves into the intersection of mental health, spirituality, and your journey to well-being. I'm Luke Duboy, joined by your resident Buddhist extraordinaire, Zal Mal. Hey Luke. Hello everyone. This is Zal. Thanks everyone for joining us, and, and today we are unwrapping the topic that is at the heart of meaningful connections and transformative conversations, the art of compassionate listening. In a world filled with noise, distractions, and quick judgments, the skill of truly listening has become a rare and really a precious gift. So here's the deal. In this episode, we're not just exploring the mechanics of listening, we're diving deep into the soul of it. Compassionate listening is more than just a communication skill. It's a profound way of connecting with others and equally importantly, with yourself. So if you've ever felt the desire to strengthen your relationships, to be more present in your interactions, or to navigate those tough conversations with grace, this episode is your guide. Whether you're a seasoned professional, someone on a spiritual journey, or just someone eager to enrich your connections, there's something valuable here for you. So like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share this podcast with others because collectively we can find a solution to all things health and wellness. And it might be a little bit harder to listen for them to listen to me today because I'm a little bit raspy, Zal. <laughs> yeah, thanks for doing it anyway. <laughs> you know, we want to get these episodes out, and hopefully, I, I will still have a voice for people to listen to while I I drink my tea. We've done episodes in the morning before the sun is up, and this just so happens to be an episode at the end of the day at night, <laughs> and uh, with a cough and a and a cold, and I'll be visiting the doctors tomorrow. But hopefully, my uh, my voice can be heard and listened to as we talk about this topic, compassionate listening. I hope you feel better soon, Luke. Thank you. I got the tea, so okay, that's a good thing. So what is compassionate listening, Zoe? Yeah, interesting topic. Uh, I don't know if there's a particular term in Buddhist tradition for the translation of compassionate listening, but that topic came up and I thought it would be helpful to talk about it because the connections is really important, uh, meaningful relationships, and it comes up a lot in my daily life too. So, But to unpack that a little bit, I do borrow that idea of compassionate uh, from Buddhist tradition when we think about the four sublimes or four, um, one of them is compassion. It comes from the word karuna, which comes after the loving kindness. So to have compassion, I guess the translation sometimes is karuna is like the, the quivering of the heart. So it's it's a, a way of relatability. Mm. Yeah, we can begin from there about this is connecting. The yeah, first time I heard you bring up the the four noble truths, but this is the first time in the podcast you've mentioned the four sublimes. Yes. What are the four sublimes? A little tangent, but if I'm if I'm curious, I'm sure some of the listeners are too. What are the four sublimes? Yeah, it's it's a little too technical. It has it also has to do with the 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 planes of existence, uh, but it is describing the four sublimes as in they're like celestial beings, uh, which has reached to meditative absorption, and they're very very calm. So these are the four states of these celestial beings where they abide. So like four sublime abodes is a translation, hmm. but it's a, a series of things, which is mitta, which the episode that we've done before, loving kindness is one of the four sublimes because that's where peace is. And then the second is the compassion, garuna. Hmm. And then the third is uh, mudita, which is the appreciative joy hmm. where you feel happy for other people's success. And then the last one, which is the most difficult one, is the equanimity, upyaka, the evenness of the mind. So those are referred to as the the four sublimes. And I think there are also other translations, but that's the translation that I remember. But in Burmese is uh Bhimaso, uh Brahma, like as in the the uh yeah, the Brahmas. Yeah. Hmm. So that's it's usually translated as the pure abodes or four sublimes. Hmm. We have so much to learn from you, Zal. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm learning. <laughs> Uh, compassionate listening, as I, myself and the listeners, hopefully we did that while you talk about the sublimes. Listening and compassionate listening is more than just hearing words, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It requires being present in a type of engagement with the person that's speaking. 
Yeah, there's a sense of selflessness too, um, because it's difficult. Maybe we can start from here about the difference between hearing and listening. Okay. You know? Because uh, what? for me, <laughs> I'm done with that. All right, okay. go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so, like the, the work that I do as an interpreter in the healthcare setting, yes, like I have a real time feedback of the difference between listening and hearing. So, if I'm not listening, I cannot do my job. Okay. Otherwise, I'm just hearing words, and I don't even know what I just heard. So it's all about that paying attention. So what I mean by selflessness is that, um, I guess, the opposite of selflessness. We can start from there. Of like, when I'm being very selfish, all my thoughts are all about me, and that's like a blockage for really hear hearing what the other person is saying. So in a way, compassionate listening is putting those self-centered, like selfish thoughts aside, so that I can really be present mm -hmm. and hear. What other people are saying. In addition to doing life coaching and recovery coaching here at the Recovery Collective, you do interpretation. Mm -hmm. And to your point, if you were just hearing, you're not working. That's that's passive. Mm -hmm. To hear someone, you doesn't take a lot of engagement and effort. It's it's pretty passive. But listening involves, I believe you said, involving the reception of sound, listening to the the enunciation and engagement with the words and I think the emotions of what someone is saying. Mm -hmm. So sometimes compassionate listening, and we're, right now I think we're highlighting some characteristics of compassionate listening. There's more than just the words that we're hearing. There, there's more action to it. Mm -hmm. It's an engagement, you know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah, it's active. But uh, we can also connect that with uh, the second foundations of mindfulness. There's just a lot of numbers, four foundations of mindfulness, four mm -hmm. noble truth, eight full path, but there are just so many numbers. But second foundations of mindfulness uh, is the mindfulness of the vedana, which is the feeling tones. Um, that's also another way of listening because we're always having that reaction to the uh, sense input, whether we know it or not. Is either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. You <laughs> mm -hmm. know, that's also another way of uh, practicing compassionate listening. That when I'm listening, how is my being responding to what I'm hearing? Yeah, I want to give another example of hearing and listening. As parents, <laughs> parents often get frustrated with their kids, and then the children say, "I'm listening. I hear you." And then the parents are still frustrated for some reason because even though they say the words, they feel that maybe that they're not truly being listened to. So my example, hearing might involve registering what someone when someone's upset. I hear you. Gosh, fine. But true listening delves into understanding why they feel that way. Yeah, it's just a great opportunity to practice mindfulness. I mean, first of all, when I'm interacting with another human being, it's like life bundle in it and mm -hmm. it's an opportunity to enter it's different from like listening to music or listening to a recording but when i'm interacting real time with another human being it's like a great opportunity to like look into the soul of that person because you're interacting with life and um hey listeners we've got something extraordinary to share a chance to reshape your journey no matter where you are you're familiar with Zal Mall's insights on our podcast, but there's more. Through the Recovery Collective, he offers life, mindfulness, recovery coaching, and meditation groups guiding you toward a fulfilled and mindful existence, no matter your location. Zal's journey from a Burmese Buddhist novice to a skilled practitioner equips him with timeless wisdom and contemporary strategies. Whether you're navigating life's shifts, seeking clarity, or pursuing self-awareness, Zal's coaching serves as a compass guiding you toward success. The best part? Zal's approach centers on your growth and empowerment. He equips you with tools to tap into your inner strengths for continuous evolution no matter where you are. Ready to take that next step in your personal growth journey? Connect with Zal Ma and the Recovery Collective at 240-813-8135 from anywhere in the world. Investigating in your journey reaps immeasurable rewards. Let Zal Mall guide you toward resilience, clarity, and empowerment, no matter where life finds you. Now, let's transition back into our conversation. Stay tuned, stay curious, and keep your journey growing. What are more of those qualities, then? 
right? We're ciphering the difference between hearing and listening. You're bringing up compassionate listening is as an example of mindfulness. I mentioned the difference is understanding that the emotions behind someone saying. So, what are some other qualities? Mindful is being present. Listening is kind of grounded in being fully present in that moment, isn't it? So if we're present in that moment when someone is talking, that gives us the ability to do what? What are the other qualities when we are completely present with the person? Yeah, this what we're talking about is strangely related to our first episode ever. Okay. When we're unpacking the idea of collectiveness, the, the synergy, uh, the sum of its parts, or the whole is greater than the sum of its part kind of thing. Yeah. So like, uh, that's what I have experienced um, more so when I'm like talking to people that I'm helping. Like when I really listen, it's like you become in tune with this greater force that comes out of two coming together. So what I mean by that is that it's almost to the point of like listening uh, to the point of losing yourself in it. Mm. So what I mean by that is that I even had a conversation about this that when I want to be useful, my idea is that how do I prepare to be useful in this conversation? I have like plans and ideas, like formulas, like what should I say? But then a friend of mine told me that the best way to help someone else is to truly listen. So what he meant by that is that I don't need to think ahead of what I'm going to say. But if I truly listen to what the other person is saying, it comes to me naturally when it's time for me to talk, you know, because I'm fully present with it. And it also creates room for silence too. Silence is okay. If somebody says something, I'm not required to respond right away. So like, I can keep listening. So yeah, that 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 to me is uh, almost like listening to the inner realm of what's actually, what am I actually hearing? And also how am I actually responding internally and then uncovering that. When I'm fully present with someone I'm not lost in what I, like you said, what I'm going to say or what I'm thinking, <laughs> whether it's in defense of myself <laughs> or any of that, there's, there's no judgment. I am present with that individual, with their words, with their emotions. I am present completely in, and with them. And that gives me ability to have curiosity. And I can be more curious of what you're saying, why you're saying it. I can be completely present with your words and your emotions. And that's compassion. Mm -hmm. That's a form of empathy. It involves not only understanding the words being spoken, but also connecting with the emotions and experiencing underlying the words that you're saying and speaking, being fully present with an individual. Mm -hmm. How loving is that? I can give I can be completely present for all of you and give you all of myself <laughs> in this conversation to be completely present emotionally, verbally connected with you. Mm -hmm. What curiosity. I don't have to take it personal. <laughs> mm -hmm. I can just be present with what you're saying, not what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Very mindful. Yeah. How unselfish is that? <laughs> It makes me think, God, I'm a selfish person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is joy in that, really listening. God, how often do I think about me when other people talk? <laughs> yeah, it's scary, right? It's scary yes. just to listen because why not, what am I going to say when that person is yeah. done talking? What am I going to say or why am I taking what you say personally or why do I have to defend myself or why do I feel the need to interject and either disagree or show you my perspective. Uh, very selfless to be completely with what someone else is saying and be mindful of that mm -hmm. as opposed to mindful of what I'm always thinking or feeling when someone else is sharing. Yeah. And we can reemphasize about the, the component of compassion, you know, because yes. uh, that's what it all comes down to. Uh, because I want to get into some of like practical mm -hmm. tips of how to practice compassion and listening. Yeah. Uh, because we're human. <laughs> yeah, we're human. <laughs> it's all about the relatability. We have that when we're, when we're talking about that karuna, the compassion a Buddhist term that's translated as the quivering of the heart. It's like a literal example. When I see somebody in front of my eyes, like getting beaten, I, I get hurt, right? Because it, there is so much relatability. Or if I see blood or if I see an accident, like there is a visceral reaction to that. 
uh, that's kind of like an extreme example. But like when I'm practicing compassion and listening, like it's honing that energy. That we can think of an example that you go to a foreign country and everybody looks different, and they're talking a foreign language, and you're just hearing. And there's like that separation, right? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, they look different, and their culture is different. I'm not hearing anything. It's just a bunch of sounds, you know. But then, I think there are also some people who listen to foreign music, although they don't um, mm-hmm. understand the language. But then there are some people who really try to listen to the feeling, like what is it actually expressing? It really requires more effort, you know. Especially when there is a difficulty listening, it becomes like an opportunity to like look for the things that I can identify with. As opposed to, I cannot identify with. So, like finding that relatability, um, it really is the the key to compassionate listening, the connection, you know, the similarities. How is silence a part of compassionate listening? Mm. You touched briefly upon it. How is mindful silence a part of it? Mm. Yeah, that's powerful, especially because I've led a lot of groups, and all my groups are a silent meditation. Uh, sometimes I'm just overwhelmed by that feeling that everybody in this group, they are intentionally being silent, and they're okay with that in this room. You know, uh, I've had those feelings uh, whenever I lead you know, groups. But I guess in terms of compassionate listening, it becomes more of a um, Either your thoughts get too noisy and you're able to pay attention and they quiet down, or you find yourself in a place of like there are so many things that are spoken without words. You know, uh, especially if you've been to a silent meditation retreat. You know, mm-hmm. like there is more being spoken than the words. You know, so uh, to connect that with uh, relatability, like if we're just sitting, you and I are just sitting <laughs> without any words. Like I pay more attention to the body language, or the temperature, or like movement, because there's no sounds, you know. Mm-hmm. So that becomes also like a a portal to go deeper into what is being revealed without the words. Yeah, we both do groups, and me as a therapist, that intentional pause allows the speaker and the listener to explore their thoughts, explore their emotions without feeling pressured. Now, sometimes do people feel pressured and like, because of that pause? Yes. But to really take in during that moment of silence and pause can be very beneficial when it comes to listening and being mindful of what my thoughts are when listening, as opposed to just reacting to what someone says Mm -hmm. allowing that second thought allowing that second emotion to come in whether it's allowing me to go back to compassionate listening and be less selfless of my thoughts (laughs) and be present again with the other with a person sharing and speaking or going "Ooh, how can i connect with this person based on what they said and what am i feeling based on what I saw or heard from that individual. So, man, that mindful silence mm-hmm. can be powerful with, with listening. Yeah. Stop me if this is too abstract and philosophical, but as you're talking, as I'm listening, something comes up about um, the difference between being and thinking. Okay. Uh, because I read it, I think it was in a 12 step literature that I was doing. It was describing about the difference between giving advice and giving yourself. Mm-hmm. Because I can be in a conversation and I can give advice through thinking. Oh yeah, this is what he's saying, so I'm gonna give this advice. But then that's kind of distant, you know? But then when I'm like giving myself, like when I'm being, if I'm just being in the present, like I'm giving myself the whole being to that conversation. Mm-hmm. And it's not really about advice anymore, you know? is about being the channel of what I'm supposed to say in that moment. Which is one of the, I think, reasons why 12-step experience, strength, and hope works so well. When you be, you are giving you, you're giving your experiences. 
you might not be telling someone what to do, but you're telling them, based on my being, based on my experience, this is how I am. And you can listen to it and relate and connect and compassionately listen to what that person is saying based on their experiences. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if I'm uh, piggybacking off what you're saying or not, but that's kind of what, what, what I'm hearing. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Okay. And so uh, let's give a couple more qualities before we move on to the next piece. Mm -hmm. We talked on about the open mindedness. We're certainly talking around, we're mentioning empathy. It's at the core, compassionate listening, not only understanding, but connecting with the emotions. So we're talking about empathy. We're talking about being patient and the silence and the curiosity, which is all, to me, giving that person complete respect based on what they're saying. I am respecting <laughs> where they're at. I'm listening to all aspects of the verbal and the nonverbal. Um, talked about mindful silence. Man, we hit a lot so far. Mm -hmm. This is good. Yeah. Authenticity. Mm. How does that hit you when it comes to compassionate listening? What, what do you connect with when I say compassionate listening? There's a lot of authenticity and compassionate listening. Mm. Yeah, that hits me hard but in the opposite direction because <laughs> I've, I've come a long way if I think about it, because, um, I used to be a very shy, like introvert person, mm. uh, which is the opposite of authenticity. Right. Uh, because especially like even in my own native language, I was just afraid of people. I can't really talk. Mm. So in a way I was not being authentic because it's all about, uh, saying something that's right, you know, so that I won't get the attention so that people would just move on. Mm. But, uh, the compassionate listening or the uh, practicing authenticity really means being vulnerable and showing your true self and um, and connecting, you know. So it was even more difficult when I was learning how to speak English mm -hmm. because I was all in my head <laughs> because, first of all, it takes me a while to comprehend what I'm hearing in English. And I also have to construct words in my head. So, and there's also a delay, right? Because I have Extra to formulate. Step or two. Huh? Yeah, I have yeah. to formulate thoughts to be able to say it. So like, yeah, the, the opposite is thinking too much, you know, but um, it's like jumping into the cold water, right? If you just keep tapping it, you're not going to go in because it's mm -hmm. cold, you're, but you just got to jump in. <laughs> I feel like that's how it is like with the authenticity, like mm -hmm. you just got to do it. And then, I mean, that, that's how it was for me. I just got to do it. And when I did it, I was like, oh, it wasn't that bad, you know, yeah. <laughs> because there is more benefits than disadvantage uh, because that's how recovery has been for me. Like I took that risk of sharing my true self to another individual. And that was like a really free experience. Uh, yeah. I hope that answers that question of uh, being yeah. genuine and authentic. Internally, as I listened to you say that I was the emotions that I felt was, wow, that makes so much sense, but I've never thought or felt that concern with you. And we certainly joke that the irony, we, we, we've we talked about this before, that you speaking on a podcast and not your <laughs> native language, <laughs> but to the level of how you just shared it, feeling that challenge, you know, is something that I was being present with <laughs> as you, as you shared. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think authentic, being authentic and being sincere and that is contagious and that is something that I think is easy when someone is sincere and authentic, that is, you can't fake that. Mm -hmm. So when you truly see and feel and hear that a lot of times the authenticity and the sincerity is shown for, I'll say from my experience when I, let's say with my therapist hat and then I work with a lot of people in early recovery and I ask them, what are they looking for when it comes to a sponsor? And so much that I realize and I'm, I'm guiding them and helping them on is, yeah, they can talk the talk, but do they walk the walk? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they might see a lot of good things, but how are you connecting to them? What are you feeling? <laughs> 
when they share their experiences, when they're in the meeting before and after, and being able to tell that sincerity is often not what is said, but what is felt, you know, and that's that authentic. And it's often through some of the characteristics that we hear in compassionate listening. Yeah. I know we're still on the uh, categories of qualities, but I think this is also a point where we can segue into the importance of practice, you know, and mm -hmm. the effort. Uh, same thing with meditation too, because I don't want this to be kind of off-putting, but uh, for me to com to listen compassionately, it requires some work mm -hmm. of my own, like self-care or my own spiritual well-being. Only then I'm able to do that, you know. What I mean by that is that you're a judgment asshole if you don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's more like, <laughs> like um, sorry, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was I thinking? I, I lost my thoughts now. <laughs> Maybe I need to listen more. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I need to listen more, not cut you off. <laughs> uh, so, like, you know, like if I am in a place where I feel comfortable in my own skin, because you know the way we're talking about the being authentic, it's also related to trust, right? Because my inability to listen comes from a place of not trusting hmm. either myself or the person that I'm talking to. I'm guarding, guarding myself up, you know, mm. because I don't want to get hurt. But then when I practice trust, which mostly comes from my knowing who I am, only then, like, there's that confidence and the trust. And then I'm able to open up more. Otherwise, I'm, like, kind of in a, in a mode where I'm, like, a standby mode to protect myself. What is he going to say that is going to hurt me, you know? So let me not try to listen. Like, kind mm. of guard it. So it makes me think of that, too, about trust. Because mm -hmm. you're trusting, do you feel that when you have that trust, you're trusting what you're actually hearing and feeling, but also trusting what you're actually feeling as well? Because I'm trying to think what, what prevents me from trusting my ability to actually listen to person and not need to react. It's not so much what they're doing in my experience, it's... What am I not trusting or what I'm not comfortable with myself? Because mm. what a person says has nothing to do about me. But why do I get uncomfortable with that sometimes? Mm -hmm. why, why am I not, whether it's comfortable or, or, or sure enough of myself just to, to be in that moment? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It goes back to that practice. You know, uh, we're just given opportunities every day, especially in this day and age. Uh, everybody's always connecting, right? Uh, I do prefer face-to-face, -face, you know, in-person connection. But if you think about 24 hours in a day, mm -hmm. uh, I like communications, uh, phone calls, you know, internet. People are always connecting. You know, we have mm -hmm. great opportunities to practice that. And um, I don't know, the world becomes like a really lovely place when you are immersed in that, connecting with people, you know. And uh, there's so much joy in it. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about more challenges of compassionate listening. One being is there, and we're, we're, I think I was just hitting on this, this internal distraction. Mm -hmm. Our minds may wander due to personal thoughts, judgments, or preconceived notions of being able, I, I hear you continue to touch upon, to be able to practice mindfulness and stay present and gently redirect <laughs> my focus back to the speaker when I'm distracted by my thoughts, my emotions, or judgment of what the person's saying. So I think that's a good challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the challenge and also the importance, uh, you know, not to kind of clarify, is that when we say compassionate listening, it's not at an individual's expense. It's not like I'm sacrificing, but there's also the compassionate listening when it comes to, sometimes I cannot practice compassionate listening if I haven't taken care of myself. Mm -hmm. So it's more important to practice compassionate listening to myself first. What is it that I need in this moment? Because otherwise it becomes all about other people to the point of like, you don't care about yourself. So like finding that balance as well is important. 
I think that's, I think we hit this really well and appropriately and go, okay, internally look at yourself. Now, what about when the other person is emotionally intense? What do you say about that? Intense as in like negative, somebody angry. That's a good example. Yeah. How do you be, how do you have compassionate listening for that? What, what, this is a collective solution to health and wellness. So we're saying be compassionate, <laughs> remove your emotions from it. Sit in the silence of connecting with this person and their, not, not just what they say, but the nonverbal. So what would you tell our listeners when there's someone that is just so emotionally intense for the example that you gave negative or mm -hmm. mean? Yeah, I guess that interestingly connects with those four sublimes, the last one, the okay. equanimity. So like, I can do my best to be the best version of myself or to be in harmony. But it, but when it comes to unwinding or kind of comforting that anger, that person is in charge, like it's on him. I cannot make somebody be rid of anger, you know? So I think that's also a good quality to, to have, to know that boundary that, okay, was it in my control and was not in my control? Sometimes the best solution is to detach myself from it if somebody is too angry, unless yeah. it is life-threatening, you know? You're, you're saying the Buddhist coach of you is saying it that way, which I love. The therapist in me says, you can have empathy for a person, but you can also have boundaries for yourself. Mm. And I think you just said it the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're not a doormat here. <laughs> you can have some room for the, we can all empathize for the healthy emotion of anger. But I think it's appropriate for me to have boundaries for myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is also another point. It sounds so subtle, but I want to take this opportunity to expand more on mindfulness. Um, mm -hmm which I don't think really is like a misconception, but maybe it is. But <laughs> like when we think about compassion or like mindfulness, um, because that's why mindfulness works better if it's in the context of Buddhism, you know? <laughs> because if we think about Eightfold Path, it's not just like mindfulness. There are other factors. And one of the most important factors is the wisdom, you know, the discernment. So like when I am practicing compassion and listening i'm not this doormat of like oh if negative comes i'm negative if Correct. positive comes i'm positive yeah. but there is that the example that i've heard of is a gatekeeper by the city and there is like a enemy city surrounding so that gatekeeper is always keeping an eye out so if a person comes in he checks is it a spy you know or is it the citizen but then, but if he's just practicing mindfulness, open awareness, he's going to let everybody in, you mm. know. But the true mindfulness is being able to differentiate, wait, is this going to help me? Is it a good thought? Is it a skillful thought? Or is it an unskillful thought? Discarding or not to pay attention to thoughts that are not mm. useful, you know. That I wanted to kind of take that opportunity to share that yeah. when we talk about mindfulness. Yeah, I think you're giving examples as your Buddhist coaching and, and myself, we've both worked with clients. Thanksgiving just passed, those Thanksgiving dinners, those family dynamics. <laughs> so we've certainly had these communications with our clients. And my example, you know, we can kind of see these patterns. <laughs> and sometimes we make um, judgments, which creates barriers, barriers and things like that. But I use the analogy of a window. Sometimes, empathetically, we have our, our window wide open. Well, a lot of times I tell my clients, well, you need, you could, would benefit from putting that screen in and filtering some of that stuff and not taking all of that emotion. Mm -hmm. And some of my clients go, nope, it was time to close that window completely. <laughs> and that was my boundary. And I didn't need to hear uncle, auntie, mother, father, sister, brother, rail on in their visceral energy and and uh it was not the time for compassionate listening that door closed good for you <laughs> yeah yeah this is good so we're i think we're certainly offering tips to practice compassionate listening with the empathy the non-attachment listening without the intention to respond but to understand that curiosity when that's not healthy 
and toxic than having that mindfulness of where we're at and being able to set boundaries, having patience, giving others the time and space to express themselves fully while not sacrificing ourselves, Mm. the generosity, the act of giving your full attention to someone else is, I think, a beautiful definition of love, being completely present. This is good stuff. Yeah. The therapist in me is like maintain eye contact, Mm. (laughs) the body language, Mm. you know, we do like mirroring where like if someone is open, you can be open. If someone has a, a, a leg on their knee, you can do the same thing. If someone's crossed, they may be more closed. Well, you can kind of close your arms. If there's different ways for you to um, do nonverbal ways to connect to people. Mm. Yeah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I have one final thought, which is um, circling back to that connection, right? That that's what's really cool in my experience about Buddhism especially the Four Noble Truth. Hmm. If I'm having trouble connecting with someone else, there's always that baseline truth that there is suffering. Yeah. So like that to me is what unites the whole um, living things in general. I can practice compassion and listen more. Like whoever that I'm interacting with, that person has a father and a mother, you know, (laughs) and that person has lost or will lose somebody that person loves. If I connect to that person at that level, Nobody's alone, you know, yeah. like in terms of feelings, like fear, sadness, everything, we are all connected from that. Uh, I mean, suffering sounds kind of negative, but it's more of like the practicality, the reality of life is nobody's perfect, you know, and I can connect with the richest person in the world and I can connect with the poorest person yes. in the world, yes. no matter what, you know. And the word compassion doesn't come from Sanskrit or Bali, but from Latin. And the word compassion has its roots, compassio, which is a combination of come, meaning together, and pati, P-A-T-I, meaning to suffer or to endure. So therefore, the literal, literal trans, the literal translation of compassion is to suffer together or to endure together. Mm. pretty powerful yeah sharing the suffering or challenges which is the core concept of compassion and being able to be present when someone shares to be with to be present with Mm. to connect to endure what they're saying and not what I'm thinking reacting feeling or all that stuff is Mm. what a gift to give ourselves and the other person Mm. Therapists do this real well. I do this five, six, seven, eight hours a day. And then, now, we're all humans, right? So even therapists can't be completely with a person 24-7 in an hour. So sometimes I have to be mindful. Oh, man, where am I going? Oh, I miss what this person said. How do I actively listen and not just passive? So something like, expand on that, will you? Oh, I need to re-engage my curiosity. I need to be more connected with this person. Or, man, I'm not sure what that person meant, so I reflect or mirror back what they said to make sure I understand what this person's trying to tell me. Mm -hmm. So therapists often have a really good skill set to be with a person with with active listening. Mm -hmm. You know? So when I get home... That's not an excuse that I can't turn that off. <laughs> right? So being able to be present with our family members after work, with our friends and family, and being mindful of that when I'm not 100% on is being compassionate for myself. So I go, wait a minute. You know, I often would get to work when I was a clinical director at 8 a.m. and then get off at 5.30 then I'd run a relapse prevention group from 6 to 7.30, and then I'd go to an Al-Anon meeting from 7.30 to 8.30. Oh. And it would take me about a half an hour of that Al-Anon meeting to slow my brain down and listen in a different way and take off the hat of the boss, the, the co-worker, the therapist, the facilitator, 
and go, oh, I need to be here so I can listen and, and you know, and turn it off mm. and listen in a different way. Yeah, it was yeah. draining. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh, one small tip since you mentioned about that is that um, whenever we have difficulty being present with what I'm hearing, you know, uh, there is a step backwards, you know, or a step down. Uh, which actually is the beginning of all the mindfulness practice. Uh, if I think about the 16 steps or the um, four foundations of mindfulness, it all starts with the breath, you know? Mm. So like, if I'm having trouble being present with people, being present with what I'm hearing, the best place to be present with, to begin with, is to be present with the breath. Mm. And that becomes, you are grounded back to earth. And that, that becomes a base where you're present. And when you're fully present in the moment, you're fully present with what you're hearing, you know? So I wanted to share that too, that how breath can be uh, a good grounding, since you mentioned about bringing the attention back, you know, mm. oh, wait, where am I going? I wanted to share that last bit. Thanks, Luke. Thank you, guys. I, thanks for listening through my raspy voice. <laughs> well, compassionate listening, as we uncovered, is more than a skill. It's a way of being with others. It's about stepping into the emotional landscape of someone else's world offering understanding and creating a space where both speaker and listener can endure the intricacies of the moment together. In our fast-paced world, where distractions abound, compassionate listening stands as a testament to the enduring strength of genuine human connection. We've explored the qualities that desire this, this art, this presence, empathy, nonverbal communication, and a host of others all contributing to the creation of of a space where vulnerability is honored and understanding flourishes. As you navigate your relationship, both personal and professional, we encourage you to carry the spirit of compassionate listening with you. Whether it's shared joy, a moment of sorrow, or a challenging conversation, let the roots of compassion guide you. By embracing the simplicity of truly hearing and understanding others, we contribute to the weaving of a more empathetic and connected world. Thank you for joining us on this journey into the heart of compassionate listening. And in the spirit of a therapist, a Buddhist, and you, may you carry the lessons of today's exploration in your everyday interactions. So until next time, stay present, stay compassionate, and continue to explore the boundless depths of the human expertise with an open heart. And if you're still listening, please like and leave a comment and share and hopefully you hear that in our voice that that would mean a lot to us thanks so much we'll see you next time <laughs>